But I always like the snakes and the um, exotic animals. Eman and my other kids, they like dogs. We have more than 40 dogs in the house. Hey guys, welcome back to the Zaddy's Talk Tea podcast, or welcome if you're a new viewer just joining us here today. Uh, we have a really special guest on the podcast today, but before we start, we would just like to say that uh, you guys on our last video really crushed it. You know, we jumped our views up all the way up to a thousand on this episode, and we we're just starting out, of course. So if you guys want to see more podcast talks with uh, some up and like with some celebrities, just talking about their come up stories and funny like gossip or like experiences that they've experienced on their journey just make sure to uh, click subscribe to feel inspired so today we actually have a filipino celebrity on our podcast uh his name is uh kuya kim atienza so kuya kim how are you doing this uh, evening here hi Connor and hi ibrahim um it's a pleasure to be here uh thank you for um, guesting me um I'm feeling great uh, tonight. Uh, I just came from work. Um, my, my newscast is, uh, I'm part of a newscast for those of you who are not from the Philippines. Uh, my name is Kuya Kim. Kuya means older brother in Filipino, but everyone in the Philippines calls me older brother. And I'm part of a newscast called TV Patrol. TV Patrol is the number one newscast in the Philippines. And I'm the, the weatherman and the knowledge and trivia, trivia person. That's what I do for a living. I've been on television for the past uh, 17 years already. And um, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. All right. Um, that's that's great. My own, actually, my own, my, I have a podcast on Facebook as well at 8.15 and I just finished doing it and uh, now I'm guesting with you. That's great. So it's like full circle. That's good All to right. hear. Um, so yeah, uh, as Kui Kim said, you know, he's on TV. He's, uh, he's on a show called TV Patrol. Um, but in the past, he's also been, uh, I think, a politician, I think, right? Of uh... Manila. Yeah. Manila, um, yes. For about uh, 12, 12 years, I was in politics. I oh, was wow. a barangay chairman in Manila. And then after that, I was a city councilor for nine years. I come from a family of, um, of politicians. My father was uh, once upon a time the mayor of Manila, but he's now a congressman. Um, and then my grandfather as well was in politics and my relatives are all in politics. So I was in politics. I tried it out for a bit, but I didn't like it. And uh, I shifted to television about the 12, uh, 17 years ago. So it's my 17th year being on television. I work in a station called ABS-CBN, and we just lost our franchise. So we were the number one station in, in the Philippines. We reached all over the world. And then the president decided to remove our franchise, and now we're still on TV. We're on digital channels. We're on social media. We're still on air, but we pretty much lessen our reach because of the loss of franchise. Well, that's great to hear. That's great to hear that you you guys are still on social media and doing your thing. Um, but now we just wanted to like, we actually took somewhat of a deep dive in your Instagram to see some posts, uh, you know, of stuff that you, uh, some photos you've accumulated on your journey to uh, success. So uh, we just we just wanted to shout, uh, start off here with this post, actually. This, po this picture here was taken with the famous boxer Manny Pacquiao. Uh, so... What is your relationship with Manny Pacquiao, Kuya Kim? Do you have like a solid relationship, solid friendship with him? I, I do have a solid friendship with Manny Pacquiao, but more than me, it's my father. My dad, uh, my father, Manny considers his second father. And I remember meeting Manny Pacquiao more than 20 years ago um, when uh, he was starting out as a boxer. When he was starting out as a boxer and he was uh, just fighting amateur fights, uh, around the Philippines and he'd have to go to Cebu or Zamboanga, he would come to my, my dad's office in Manila City Hall and my dad would give him a little bit of uh, pocket money and allowance and the transportation money. He was that broke then. But dad was always a supporter of Manny Pacquiao up until he became uh, the Manny Pacquiao that we know now. But dad would always go to the States and would be with him um, on the ringside and uh, give him support. And then would, whenever he'd come home, my dad who was mayor then, would give him a victory parade, whether he wins or not. But because of my dad's closest to Manny, all the kids became close to him as well. So he, he knows me as a brother. But uh, <laughs> my dad my dad is actually closer to Manny Pacquiao than I am. But um, yeah, Manny's like a virtual brother. That uh, uh, yeah, there. Yeah. That's my relationship with him. That's great. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I never knew that before. All right. 
So next so thing we want to some, talk about here. Okay. So since you have a vlog channel, we see that you have tons of pets, some exotic pets as well, like snakes. And we just want to know what's like the inspiration for so many animals. Is there like a deep connection or like a background story to your relationship with like animals? Yeah. Um, I always liked exotic animals. I do have dogs. I took care of cats when I was young. But my passion really lies on exotics. And now some birds as well. But I like reptiles. I like snakes. I like creepy crawlies. Um, this started when I was young. I grew up in a little apartment full of aquariums. Because my dad was a fish collector and a fish breeder. So I grew up with my, seeing my dad taking care of his fish and breeding his guppies and his black crawlies. And uh, it, it just inspired me to, to put something in an aquarium. So I would put frogs, earthworms, little things that I would catch uh, growing up in San Andres. Up until I grew up, my first, I remember um, I was around 11 or 12 years old. And uh, it was after Christmas. And after Christmas in the Philippines, you're given a lot of money, you know. And I had about 100 pesos. And I went straight to the pet store in Cartimar. And the first thing I bought was a reticulated python at 11. And uh, this python actually got away. <laughs> but I always liked the snakes and the um, exotic animals. Eman and my other kids, they like dogs. We have more than 40 dogs in the house. Oh. And I breed tortoises. And I have uh, different kinds of turtles and different kinds of snakes uh, that I still keep. And, but I use them for shows. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I have a show with uh, Savior School. So it's show and tell. So I'm going to be showing them uh, different reptiles from different uh, families. Chelonians and uh, pythons and, uh, and other stuff. Yeah. That's All right. right. That's great. And then uh, last thing we wanted to dive on here was actually you became around the time of 2000, like in the late, two, like in the early 2010s, you actually started to become mm -hmm. an avid triathlete. So just tell us, and I'm looking through my notes here as well, um, that you've been like in some pretty dangerous situations and that's what motivated you to Help yeah. yeah. That's good research, Conor. Um, in 2010, I suffered a stroke. And when I suffered the stroke, I thought I lost my speech. The stroke hit the left frontal lobe of my brain. And that's the part of the brain that's in charge of intelligence, uh, speech, language, knowledge. And I was so scared that I prayed that I told God, I'm, I'm, I'm a born, born again Christian, by the way. I told the Lord and I said, if you give me back my, my faculties, if you heal me from the stroke, then it'll be the best game I can be. I'll be a triathlete, I'll be a marathoner, I'll be... And you know, God made me well and I became well again. And so that started my journey as a triathlete. It started with, a, I was required to walk 30 minutes a day after my stroke. The walk became a run, and then the run became a marathon. After a year after my, my stroke, I ran my first 42-kilometer run, my first full marathon in Bordeaux, France. And then after that, I got into cycling. And then since I was cycling already and, and running, I said I'm going to be a triathlete. So about the two years after my stroke, I joined my first half Ironman, which is what you see here in Cebu. And then three years after my stroke, I signed up for my first full Ironman. A full Ironman is a four-kilometer swim, followed by a 180-kilometer bike, followed by a 42-kilometer run. And I was so fit for it, and I knew that I was going to finish it in about 11 or 12 hours. And then um, I, saw, I got sick again. <laughs> this time, it's a different disease called uh, GBS. You can Google that. Or Guillain-Barre syndrome. It's an autoimmune disease that causes paralysis. And I became paralyzed. My feet and my hands became paralyzed. This was the time that I cried to the Lord again. And I prayed to him and I said, if you, if you make me well, I want to get to know you. That was the time that I accepted Jesus Christ. And that was the time that I became Christian, a born-again Christian. That was in 2013. And uh, since that time onwards, I've been going very steadily, uh, walking with, with God every single day. Still fit. I still swim, bike, and run. And now I golf also with my son because my son's here vacationing from um, Tufts University in Boston. And um, that's my story. Yeah, that's the story behind my triathlon journey. That's I great. Got scared. <laughs> that, that was uh, really inspiring. I didn't know that there was so much like, you know, motivation and, extra you know, details. extra details. Yeah, exactly. So what was the cause of the syndrome again? Was it just you were born with it or did you develop it? Like, how did uh, you? Guillain-Barre syndrome, that's why it's called the syndrome. Nobody knows the cause. 
it just hits one out of 100,000 people randomly. You can be young or old, you can be a female, male, um, it, but it's creeping paralysis. It starts from the tip, tip of your fingers and then your hands and your feet and then it becomes until you're totally, totally paralyzed. Um, the, the disease is self-limiting, meaning it will heal itself in time, just like the flu. There's no medicine for it, but the symptoms are, are deadly because total paralysis will eventually cause death. No, um, right. So the, they had to cure the symptoms. And I, had, I was in the in ICU for uh, 10 days and I was in the hospital for a few weeks again uh, to get well. And again, God healed me and I'm still at it. Uh, still a triathlete, uh, still training, still running for God's glory. Yeah. All right. All right. That's great. Uh, what, so since you're like a news reporter, we just wanted to know what was like the thing that really inspired you to become a news reporter as opposed to like a politician like the rest of your family? Um, I started out on television, like any politician, because um, I was going to run for mayor. My dad was mayor of Manila then, and he was already on his last term. And I was uh, chosen to replace him. And I figured being on television was a good way to get exposure so I can get elected. A lot of politicians are on TV for that reason, eh? because they want to get elected. Um, only to realize that I actually love television more than politics. So after a few months of uh, exposure on television, I was part of a morning show in ABS-CBN. Um, the weatherman then, his name is Ernie Baron, and he was considered a walking encyclopedia because he was so smart. He died. And he, they needed to get a replacement for Ka Ernie Baron. And it so happened that I was there in the station and I was the, the perfect replacement. So the station told me, um, you got to choose either politics or television. Cannot be both. And I chose uh, television. And that's 17 years ago. That's how I got into TV. Wow. It's so crazy how you like, you know, you found your passion um, in news or in, like in TV when that wasn't even your intention in the first place. It was just to like get, exactly. get, more, get, get more publicity. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's that's really how you found your career but like speaking of career um what advice would you give like some young up-and-coming high school students let's say uh advice to be successful in the future and just to be happy you know to make it like you for let's say there are three p's that i follow three p's letter p the first p is passion what are you passionate about only you can say what you're passionate about, not your parents. But of course, you ask for guidance from your parents, no? But uh, you, you know what you're passionate about. Is it the arts? Is it, uh, is it mathematics? There are people who like that. Is it science? Is it being a doctor? What's your passion? What, what, examine your heart. Um, number two is prayer. I pray a lot. There are times when we don't know what our passion is. Like you guys, when you're young, you have so many passions. You don't actually know what's number one passion because there's so many things. You're passionate about girls. You're passionate about parties. You're passionate about so many things. But if you pray, then you're, you get your guidance. That's the number two P for my success. And number three is purpose. What am I here for? What am I doing this for? If ever I do something, what should it be for? What is my purpose in life? Me being Christian, my purpose is to give God glory in everything I do. It can be wiping the floor. It can be cleaning the bathroom. It can, it can be doing my newscast on TV. It can be riding my motorcycles. It can be doing triathlon. But what is my purpose? Am I giving God glory by doing it? If I'm giving God glory, then that's my purpose. So it's a, merge, it's, it's a merger of three Ps. Your passion, doubled with prayer, and then you find your purpose. Three piece. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so, like, based on your career path, if you could go back in time and just change one thing, what do you think you would have changed? Or what do you think you would have done differently any oh, time nothing, in your life? Nothing, nothing. Um, everything turned out well. Um, I am so happy that I ended up on television. And I'm so happy that uh, for some reason I was able to turn away from politics and be on television because politics would have been so miserable for me. It's so hard to be a good person on, in politics. Just to be able to exist in that world, you'd have to compromise your principles. You'd have to do certain things that have to be done 
just to survive, huh? not even to thrive. Now, if you want to thrive in politics, then you do things that are worse. Mm-hmm. Oh, it is yeah. so hard to be in politics. It's hard to be a good person in politics. Mm-hmm. It's so hard. So I, I'd yeah. rather not be in politics. That's why I'm happy. I'm, I'm in, in, on television. And if there's anything that I'd like to change, nothing. Yeah. Nothing. That time in the, I think, wasn't that the 80s when you were like starting in politics, 80s or 90s? Was that? That was uh, 1992 when I became counselor. Oh, wow. Um, uh, yeah, you're here, right? 1980s, I was a uh, barangay chairman. No, 1990. Barangay chairman, and then in 1993, 1992, I was a city councilor, mm-hmm. and I was a city councilor for nine years, and then I worked for the mayor also, and I worked for the vice mayor as well. Yeah, the old um, like the using like being a politic and doing like worst like things that you know probably wouldn't be morally right. That was really like common in the time in the Philippines in the 1980s. You know, obviously with the with the well, politics. You know, and so on. We, in, in the 80s, politics in the Philippines was quite clear. It was black and white. It was either you're for administration or against administration. If you're for Marcos, you're against Marcos. If you're more for Marcos, then you're not in EDSA. EDSA won in 1986. I was part of. That was three days on the street. We laid out our bodies, blocked the tanks, ready to die for democracy. And politics then was very clear. It was black or white. Now, politics has become so gray. There's so many sides, there's so many parties, there's so many principles, you don't actually know where to go. I'd rather stay away from it. Yeah. Okay. Right. That, uh, so do you, that, do you that, think that you are happy that you like saved your morals becoming a new, like working on television instead of politician? Oh, because you. Definitely, definitely. That's an understatement. Definitely. Yeah. It, yeah. It's much easier, more conducive to be a good person being where I am than, than rather than being in politics. Mm-hmm. Because what you, what you said earlier about like, you know, you wouldn't change any, if you had to go back and change anything about your life, you wouldn't change it. You know, obviously in politics, uh, like you said, you know, maybe you didn't do things that uh, what you, what you're looking back on it, uh, what you like, maybe you think that some of the things you didn't do were like, morally right but you know that's important for growth as a person you know obviously we make mistakes in life but um we're just here to get better and, you know oh, definitely. yeah i made a lot of mistakes yeah you're right yeah and oh, even yeah. yeah and even like today you know i you know all of us are all going through like you know our personal problems but you know we're all just here to grow and get and become better people so i think what you said quick came about you not wanting to go back and change change anything about your life i think that's really inspiring i must say thank you thank you very much um so yeah um i think we're going to wrap up this episode of the podcast here we had kuya kim on um and if you are you know a fan of kuya kim or you just support him make sure that you know hit subscribe to see more interviews of like famous people who explain their come up and you just give life advice so that was great uh Kui kim that we had you on um so we're gonna sign off now thank you guys for watching and we will see thank you next you so time much. see you guys okay. Okay. my pleasure